coming into Sabbath together. At this time, we're going to call him Brother Williams. Brother Williams will be blessing us this evening. We're going to hand the meeting to you, Brother Williams. Over to you. Okay. Okay. Greetings at this Sabbath. Let me wish everyone all the blessings, the showers of blessing that the Lord can pour on you as individuals and as a family and different family units. Mic check. Mic check. Stay you clear. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always good to have that out the way. Well, uh, <clears throat> excuse my throat. It is my thorn, one of my thorns. Well, let me say it's a joy to be with you. It's an honor and I'm thrilled to speak uh, in your hearing the word of the Lord tonight in this slot. Uh, the topic I want to have sort of phrased is, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? And of course, as we go through the discourse, we will obviously get a better understanding of what is this. Get a better understanding of what is this. Uh, of course, you hear the different things. We are people who are, who are keen with the current events, right? You saw what happened in Israel this week, last week. One of the biggest protests of their time since 1948, when they were sanctioned to be gathered back to the to the land. Um, heard of some little children, especially all three or, or nine, nine years of age, along with some adults, they were cut down in the school. And ever so often we hear these things and we rock back and come again. It's just normal in America. And it's becoming normal for the world because when America sneezes, the world catches the cold. Uh, one more thing. I uh, don't know if you pay that in mind, but the president, past president Trump, was indicted. <clears throat> Tonight we shall, my queen is with me, thank God she is my main squeeze, my better half, and she is the one that, you know, hold me up. So I'm glad that she's with me and if you indulge us a bit, we're going to sing a song. Uh, and thank you for that song, that closing song there, because you will notice that it's right in line with this song that I have chosen, that we have chosen to sing tonight. <coughs> so let's be with us. <coughs> Okay, sit there. Okay, sit there. 
we're going to have a quick thought and then we pray uh, from that word. We are reading Genesis 3 verse 15 from the symbolic Twelve symbolic code number five, page five. And it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We cannot possibly misunderstand what woman God meant in the scripture, for there was only one woman, Eve, then on the earth. In the presence of Adam and Eve and the serpent, God spoke these words predicting the future outcome of Eve's seed and the serpent. Eve's children were to have their heel bruised by the serpent, the devil. And in return, the children of Eve, the human family, were to bruise the devil's head, the serpent's head. Now you know that even if one's leg were to be amputated, one can live on. But when one is decapitated, his life immediately ends. God predicted here that there was to be enmity between good and evil all through time. And though the serpent would wound the human family, yet the descendants of Adam and Eve were finally to bruise the serpent, Satan's head. But you may say, Christ is to do that. I do not wish to dispute your word, but actually it is Christ through the human family that is to accomplish it. And we will stop it. Yeah, it's up. Yeah, yeah. Are we still good? Unmute your mic. Oh, oh, they were. Uh, although it went muted, it's still. Are uh, you hearing me now? We didn't hear one voice of the scene. <laughs> really? What it, was it muted huh? that time? Uh? No, it was. It was. It was open, but you were a bit too far from the mic. So we are right at the computer. Okay, we weren't able to hear. Maybe the music drowned it out. We didn't hear one line, not either. Uh, wow, okay. Sorry about sorry that. About... <laughs> All right, um, did you hear the reading? Not of it. Okay. Hmm? I want that reading. All right, let's try again. That's, that's all these things are, never mind. Hmm. <coughs> Tim, just please shout if you're not hearing anything. Okay, we are reading from 12 Symbolic Code, number 5, page 5. Brother Hutif commenting on Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We cannot possibly misunderstand what woman God meant in the scripture, for there was only one woman, Eve, then in the earth. In the, pre in the presence of Adam and Eve and the serpent, God spoke these words predicting the future outcome of Eve's seed and the serpent. Eve's children were to have their heel bruised by the serpent, the devil, and in return, the children of Eve, the human family, were to bruise the devil's head, the serpent's head. Now you know that even if one's leg were to be amputated, one can live on. But when one is decapitated, his life immediately ends. God predicted here that there was to be enmity between good and evil all through time. 
And though the serpent would wound the human family, yet the descendants of Adam and Eve were to finally bruise Satan's head. But you may say Christ is to do that. I do not wish to dispute your word. But actually it is Christ through the human family that is to accomplish it. Amen. Amen. I want you to listen carefully to that line. Christ through the human family. And we'll pray on this. And then I ask you the question again. Are you ready for this? And when I say this, we are breaking it down. And we are living in the time when not Christ himself personally, but through his people, all we need to do is accept that. Pray with us, please, our Father and our great King. Infuse us with the Holy Spirit of truth even now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> uh, tonight you are going to discover one of my favorite quotes. And um, <clears throat> it's my favorite for many reasons. And maybe, just maybe, after this uh, presentation, you will make it your personal uh, favorite quote. Um, <clears throat> of course, you have others. A reading from, it will be from 1TG number 17. Uh, page 3 and I'll take some excerpts and come back. This afternoon we are to study the 10th chapter of Zechariah to find a time, well, let me back up. The title of this is Bright Clouds Bring Gentle Rain. Bright clouds brings gentle rain. That's my favorite. This afternoon we are to study the 10th chapter of Zechariah. To find the time of the fulfillment of its prophecy and of the promises it contains, we need look no further than the first verse of the chapter And the first verse says, Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall bring bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every grass in the field. Rain to every grass in the field. These figures of speech, you know, are not used by inspiration from a Curiously, the term latter rain must have its special and accurate significance. Inspiration chose to use the term rain because rain makes things grow and brings abundance of harvest. The term latter denotes the last rain before the harvest, the rain that completes maturity and that ripens the grain. The latter rain of truth, therefore, is the very last, the one that is to develop the people of God for the harvest, for the time in which God separates the wheat from the tears, Matthew 13, 30, the wise virgin from the foolish ones, 
Matthew 25, 1 to 12. The good fish from the bad, and the sheep from the goats. In short, the harvest is the day of cleansing, the day of judgment, the antitypical day of atonement, the day in which the sinners are cut off. The spiritual reign is therefore to do the church just what the natural reign does to the field. Without the latter rain, the saints could not develop for the heavenly garner. Neither could the tears for the fire. By the latter rain, therefore, is illustrated the last shower of truth. Ask your neighbor, are you ready for this? Turn to your, your, your neighbor, uh, don't sleep on me tonight. If you're in bed, get up. Uh, there comes a time we need to have a little revival around here. So, get ready for a little revival. <clears throat> we talk about revival and reformation. I might get to that reading, but I'll stick to revival. Uh, Renewal of the spiritual life, a resurrection yes. from the dead. All right. So, jumping on. Well, let us remember that it is not left in the field. No, I didn't reach that far. Well, you know what is it? Just as soon as the final touch of development is accomplished, the sickle is to be put to the precious grains. Well, let us remember that it is not left in the field to rot. It is put into the barn. It is put into the barn. Jumping down. Plainly then, the latter rain is miracle working truth that causes the saints to mature for the harvest, of which the 144,000 are the first fruits. Then, in order to quickly gather the second fruit, God pours his Spirit upon every first food saints upon every one grass old or young boy or girl not upon one here and upon one there yes so are we ready for our moment brothers and sisters are we ready for our time this is not we are not living in Noah's time. And if we were living in Noah's time, we have to ready for Are we ready for a mom our moment to get on with what the Lord says? And I'm coming down to where I'm going, jumping over. Literally speaking, Page 5. Dark clothes suggest a very heavy and damaging rain that frightens the beholders. Are we ready for the simple, light, bright clothes that brings the light? easily assimilated rain that doesn't frighten the people. Are we ready for a moment? Because it seems like we need another person's moment, not our moment. We want to swap. 
who want to swap I'll make sure everybody hearing me because I hear somebody speaking I don't know if he's speaking yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Am I coming through or I need to change something? We're hearing you. Okay. You're doing fine. Okay, thank you so much, my dear. Because I heard somebody say something and I was... Uh, Brother Smith, sometimes this, this um, screen just go away. Is it on my side or your side? Oh, okay, it's on my side. Let me fix it. Uh, we have to put you. you on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's when somebody speak. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, tell me when you're ready. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So, brothers and sisters, we have come into the moment when the truth is like bright clouds, think about that, that brings gentle rain. Mm -hmm. So the, so the, the little children will not be frightened, much more adults like us, and a lot of us are scared. <laughs> we are scared because we are not accepting and expressing pardon me expressing the truth in the way God has given us we have come to the butter section we have come to the crowning point so you don't need to do anything there's no interpretation to be done Take it as it is and run. Amen. It is that simple, brothers and sisters. And sometimes we need to preach to our people. We need a little revival to tell us where we are, how we are doing. Brother, you don't need anything else. It is light rain. Let me read again. Volume 1, <coughs> number 17, page 5. Literally speaking, dark clouds suggest a very heavy and damaging rain that frightens the beholder. Conversely, the bright clouds suggest a gentle rain, the kind that descends in such a way so that the ground can absorb all of it, every bit of it, it does not waste itself. Amen, brothers and sisters. Then to the spiritual latter rain must fall as freely and without cost to the recipient and does not, as does literal rain. This is one of my favorite quotes, and I hope you will make it your favorite quote, because we don't need an interpreter. All we need to do is take the butter and use it, take the honey. It is already, it is already um, done by the bees, and the, 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 the ivy is, the thing is, Taken out, the frame is taken out from the box. The honey has been extracted. It is for you to take it as it is. Bright clouds. That's what the Bible, that's what the inspiration is telling us. Don't jumble this thing. Are we ready for a moment? Are we ready for this? Uh, Smith, I'm going to share my main topic tonight. And I concur with lifting up Christ. 
Brother Ralph last week he lifted up Christ. I'm going to I'm going to lift up Christ tonight. Because all we have to do is lift up the rod. If I find my page. One moment, let me see. I guess I have to. <clears throat> Am I sharing? Are you? Uh, no, okay. Art. One quick moment, let me get this thing out. Sure, but you need to go into PowerPoint mode. Oh yes, I'm going there. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, we're going to look at Thy Kingdom Come Part 2. Uh, <coughs> Thy Kingdom Come Introduction. Welcome. Welcome to the second part of our study on the kingdom on thy kingdom come. Though this is a study concerning the premillennial phase of God's kingdom of glory, this section of our study will mainly deal with questions and answers on the very subject we have been talking about. Of course, we are familiar with part one of this study. The question we will be examining <coughs> and answer today are numerous. They will include, <coughs> for example, question number one. Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world. How does that fit in with what we have said concerning the kingdom beginning before Jesus comes, which we talk about pre kingdom? Well, we pray already, so I'm just going to move right along. This study is divided into subsections. Clarifications only will be welcomed at the end of each section. Please write down all questions for question answer or Q&A and discussion time when that becomes necessary. There are five sections that we will look at. But some of the questions that we will look at uh, Jesus also said that the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, have you ever heard Bieber ask you that? Yes, well, I've got that. Sister White in early writings, that's question number three, said that all Jerusalem would never be rebuilt. Ah, that's a, that's a sermon right there that they will bring to you. Uh, but it's just one line. I guarantee you that they take and they blow it up. The fourth question would be found in Great Controversy, page 322. The statement is made that, and I read, not until the personal advent of Christ will, God, will God's people receive the kingdom, not until he comes. The fifth question we look at would <clears throat> involve Sister White seeing little children in the new earth. That's the question. Did she see little children in the new earth? The sixth question. What will happen to the Jews and the Arabs now who are occupying Palestine? Number seven. How will we get to the kingdom? Many would like to know how we would get there. Through what means? Number eight. How does persecution example, running to the hills. How does persecution fit in with the idea of a kingdom of peace in Palestine? Peace and persecution. Number nine and last, what is the meaning of the term Judah and Israel? Well, of course, 
Brothers and sisters, I know that you <coughs> have, are familiar with these questions, uh, if you have been around for a while, uh, uh, and of course you have your way of answering it. The, there, there are answers for every one of them. And so we'll attempt to see. This is section one, and so let's see if we can go through section one. Let us begin by looking at the first question, <coughs> and I would like you to help me read sometimes because, but that I tell you when. Mm. I just seen her because. Uh, so, <coughs> the first question that we refer to, the question is concerning. John 18 and verse 36, that's John 18 and verse 36, if you want to make notes of this, where Jesus says that his kingdom was not of this world. That's the Bible, that's quote. How do you relate to that? Well, let's look at <coughs> that. Take your Bibles, if you wish, I read. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Mm -hmm. You will remember, or I'll refresh you, that Jesus made this statement in responding to Pilate. Yes, a question which Pilate asked him, and Jesus responded that his kingdom was not of this world. Now, this statement could not be used to prove that there will not be a kingdom on the earth be before Jesus comes, be because of sin and corruption, that part they will bring in. Yes, there will be sin and corruption in this world up to the second coming of Christ. Nonetheless, the <clears throat> this does not, <clears throat> nonetheless, this does not mean that God cannot have a kingdom when sin and corruption still exist. No, because he had one before. During the ruling of the judges, the kings like David, Solomon, God had a kingdom in the midst of the world then. This was done with the heathen nations around. But that is precisely the point, brothers and sisters. God wants the kingdom to begin with the, what? The heathen around to see it as a testimony of his love, his goodness, his mercy and justice. A testimony which cannot be gainsay. When God establishes the kingdom with people in mortal flesh, Get that one. Mortals will inherit this part of the kingdom. Yes, yet perfectly reflecting his holy character in a pure environment. That will be a testimony that cannot be argued. It will be the last witness to a dying world. Furthermore, in Christ Object Lesson, Christ Object Lesson, page 77, the pen of inspiration writes this concerning the very same thing that Jesus made in John 18.36. And that's Christ's object lesson, page 77. Listen to what she says, I read. Earthly governments prevail by physical force. They maintain their dominion by war, but the founder of the new kingdom is the Prince of Peace. The Holy Spirit represents worldly kingdom under the symbol of fierce beast of prey, but Christ is a Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. In his clan of government there is no employment of brute force to compel the conscience. That's beautiful. Thus we see that Jesus meant that his kingdom is not of the spirit of the world. Say amen, somebody. His kingdom is not of the spirit of the world. Not that his kingdom would never exist in this world. Oh yes, Jesus then can have a kingdom. But he, before he returns, but it will not be of the spirit of the world. Question number two includes Luke. 
17, uh, the very old slide, so. <laughs> Luke 17, 21, where Jesus states that the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within me and you. Let's read that. Luke 17, 21, I read. <coughs> Neither shall there they say, Lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within us. Oh, yes, that is a true statement. Some ask, how then can it be that the, uh, can, it, can it be that an earthly kingdom exists? If the kingdom of God is within us, how well, can God then have a kingdom before he returns on this earth? The kingdom of God is only to be confined in our hearts. Answer. If the statement in question means that there is to be no kingdom of God on earth, then by the same token of reasoning, it must also mean that neither is there to be a kingdom in heaven. And if there is to be none on earth and none in heaven, then our hope is vain. Consequently, to stand up upon the proposition of the question is to take the position that there is to be no literal kingdom either on earth or in heaven, but only a spiritual kingdom within our hearts, which is to reduce the subject to an absurdity. Of course, you can find this in Tuanser. I'll tell you that Tuanser uh, 45, 89 I have there. So before, God, before the kingdom of God is established on this earth, it must indeed be spiritually established within us if we are ever to qualify for admission when it is physically established upon the earth as in heaven. Upon the earth as in heaven. In other words, then, we have to first be fitted for God's kingdom in our hearts before we can be there physically. But that does not mean that we will not be there will not be there physically, or that there will not be a physical kingdom of God's glory. According to this <coughs> scripture, scriptural, spiritual kingdom of God within is within those who embody the principle of its rule before the physical kingdom is established. So, the kingdom of God within is the regimen of the spiritual life. It is prerequisite to an inheritance in the eternal kingdom of God. Question number three. That question is found in early writings, page 75, where Sister White seemed to give the indication that there will be never, there will never be a kingdom in the Holy Land. At least so it is interpreted. Let's read this statement. It's 1 line. <coughs> Uh, it says in early writing, page 75, near the bottom of the page, I read in your hearing. I also saw that all Jerusalem never would be built up. That's the point. That's the, the quote. I'm sure some of you have had that because way back when, this is one of the first things they threw on you. All Jerusalem will never be rebuilt. And they laugh at you and go. The servant of the Lord here was not saying that there could never be a kingdom in Jerusalem or that it would never be built up physically 
Of course, it is built up today. There is a false prophet. No, that statement is correct. Since this statement was written, the Jews had established a state and Jerusalem had become a famed metropolis of Palestine. It is obvious then that Sister White was not referring to the physical restoration of Jerusalem, but that the unbelieving Jews endeavor to re-establish Jerusalem as it was under the old order. <clears throat> that will never be. The context of early writing statements statement reveals that it refers to the Jewish Zionist movement and it shows that the movement avowed purpose to re-establish a nation, national Jewish homeland centered in Jerusalem proper will never be realized. That never would Jerusalem be rebuilt in accordance Watch this. Never will Jerusalem be rebuilt in accordance with the Zionist interpretation. And never will the non-Christian Jews be the subjects of the kingdom. Somebody say Amen because that's what we're talking about. But the question is, are we ready for this? Furthermore, it, if we go back to this statement on page 75 of early writings and read the entire paragraph, we find that the servant of the Lord was not speaking against God's establishing a kingdom in Jerusalem, but zealous believers who were trying to evangelize the Jews, Jewish people. In other words, she was condemning the idea of going to Palestine trying to evangelize unbelieving Jews that were, that <coughs> were there to become Seventh-day Adventists. This is what she was condemning. Listen to the entire statement again. Let us go back there to early writings, page 75, and let us read from the top of the paragraph, <coughs> thereby giving us the context. Context is key. Reading in your hearing. Then I was pointed to some who are in a great error of believing that it is their duty to go to old Jerusalem and think they had a work to do there before the Lord comes. Such a view is calculated to take the mind and the interest from the present work of the Lord under the message of the third angel. For those who think that they are yet to go to Jerusalem, they'll, they'll have their minds there and their means will be withheld from the cause of present truth to get themselves and others there. I think we still have people who are going to um, Jerusalem now, right? Going yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yes. People are fascinated with that. I saw, continue, <coughs> that such a mission would accomplish no real good, that it would take a long while for a while to make a very few of the Jews believe even in the first advent of Christ. Much more to believe in a <laughs> second advent. I saw that Satan had greatly deceived some of some in this thing, and that souls all around them in this land could be helped by them and led to keep the commandments of God. But they were leaving them to perish. Also saw that all Jerusalem never would be built up. So you see the context. You see that <clears throat> from the context we get a different picture. The statement is then telling us that God does not intend for us to go and to try to evangelize the unbelieving Jews that are now there in Palestine. That is not 
the general purpose of the church. And she was rebuking those who felt that this was their duty. At that time she was instructing them not to go, not to do that. This does not contradict what we have studied about the kingdom of God's glory before Jesus comes. We are not endeavoring to go and preach the gospel to the Jews, but rather to the entire world. And we know this, the, the process. What we have studied in our subject is not the event Evangelizing or proselytizing of the Jewish people, but the preaching of the gospel to all nations. Nor is any being encouraged to go to Jerusalem now. So Sister White's statement does not contradict what we have studied on the premillennial phase of the kingdom of God's glory. It is in perfect harmony. It just goes to show then that the old order of things as we know it today in Jerusalem or as they are trying to bring it about, it's not going to happen. But instead, God will have <clears throat> an order, a new order, his order where his people will serve him in spirit and in truth, not according to the old order or old system. And now I've reached section two, and I pause for clarifications and brother uh, clarifications from what I have discussed. Let me see the time. Okay, we have a hand there, brother Roka. Go ahead. Oh, is it now that we finish? Sorry. Um, is it that this time we, we? We have a we have a question. We have a question. Yeah, but I'm asking you, is it? the time to stop at nine. Uh, you can go a little over okay. if you're not finished. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> well, well um, the way I structure it is that we do clarification on what question was dealt with and then so if Brother Roker go ahead with the clarification then we will do the question and Q&A. Maybe, maybe, I, I, maybe I just do a, one more section. Go ahead, brother. Good evening and happy Sabbath. Let, let's try to be brief because the time is going right. Go ahead. Good evening and happy Sabbath, brother Smith and brother Williams. Pleasant Sabbath. Yes, um, yes my brother. Uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, I think it was Thy Kingdom Come, um, shows, you know, the prerequisite. Um, the kingdom is first established within us, our hearts, our minds, our department, living uh, the Word of God out completely through obedience. And then it is done um, so physically. So that is almost like a passport, if you will, um, um, clearance, if you will, to be made fit to enter the kingdom physically. And so this is, this is very, very fascinating and interesting. And um, I just thank God for this uh, reading and this piece of study here. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Go ahead, Lord. Okay. All right. So I'm going to just go. Now let us look at the fourth question. This question is based on Great Controversy, page 322, where inspiration made this statement. Not until the personal advent of Christ can his people receive the kingdom. Answer? This statement has been used to disprove the kingdom beginning before Jesus returns. This cannot be so, though, because when we read the context of the statement, we see that the servant of the Lord was referring to the kingdom of immortality, 
when the righteous shall inherit immortality, when they put on, as it were, in corruption. Read on above on page 322 and 323 gives us a clear understanding of what she was endeavoring to bring across. She says at the top of the page, at his coming, the righteous dead will be raised and the righteous living will be changed. We shall not all sleep, says Paul, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And in his letter to the Thessalonians, after describing the coming of the Lord, he says, The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Near the top she says, But when Jesus comes, he confers immortality upon his people, and then he calls them to inherit the kingdom, of which they have hitherto been only heirs. Before going any further, we need to focus on a very important Bible principle, that is that no one prophet has had an understanding of all the truth. Yes, Sister White here was referred or talking about the kingdom and its final phase. When we shall put on immortality and incorruption. She was not condemning the idea of a kingdom before. But she is only pointing out that we will not inherit the kingdom of immortality. We will not put on immortality. We will not experience that. That's the kingdom that she was talking about. That is at the coming of our Lord. But there's an important principle here that we need to focus on. And that is again, no one prophet has had an understanding of all the truth. So that we should not expect Sister White to explain or to write what we now are discovering from the word of God. She would not put it in terms as we understand it now as we see it plainly from scripture. She herself says that no man, however honored of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of redemption, or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. Men do not fully understand what God would accomplish by the work which he gives them to do. They do not comprehend it in all its bearings, the message which they utter in his name. That statement was taken from the Great Controversy, page 4, 343. That was clear and plain statement that tells us that no one messenger of God, no matter how honored of God, will understand all that pertains to even their own message or to even a future message. God only gives so much light at the time. Nonetheless, it must be in harmony with the word of God. No prophet of God has ever forged a complete prophetic chain of events with no missing links. It has taken many inspired writers to complete the long chain of prophecy. The man, therefore, which takes the position that Sister White has done what no other prophet in or out of the Bible has ever done does so at the disregard of actual Bible procedure and also of revealed truth. That Sister White's statement in the Great Controversy, page 322, she is there speaking of the kingdom complete after the dead are raised at the time the saints receive it. This was the only phase of the subject, the consummate phase. That is the final phase that God has made known to her at that time. And that's the only phase about that she wrote. Now as the scroll of truth has unrolled further, as we understand more of God's word, we can now see the kingdom in reality indeed, and we see it now not only in heaven or the new earth, but also just before it comes. It begins here before Jesus comes. In Ezekiel 36, we read that in the first part of our subject, we found out that God was going to glorify his name by establishing his kingdom. That's the reason why he wants to do it now before he returns. That is, he wants to do it premillennially, before the 1,000 years begin. 
And so now we look forward to the final phase, but we also realize that it must begin before Jesus comes. Yet Jesus says that we are miserable and poor and blind and naked because we do not see our spiritual poverty. Oh yes, God loves us. He knocks at our doors, our heart's doors, begging for us to turn to him. So as we look at Sister White's writing, we may not see the kingdom as clearly as we have studied it in our particular subject. However, it is there in all its completeness. This same circumstance is natural and common to every writer. You may be wondering, like who? Well, take for example John the Baptist. John the Baptist was to proclaim not the setting up of the kingdom so much, but the coming of the king. But in announcing the one that is in announcing the coming of the king, he incidentally had to answer questions concerning the other, which is the kingdom. When speaking of the coming king, he, ex he expressed himself in terms of revealed truth. But when circumstantially alluding to the coming kingdom on which there was no special light in his day, he necessarily expressed himself in terms of the doctrine as then commonly understood, he taught them according to the common understanding of that day. He believed the kingdom would be established then in his time, just as all the other Jews, I believe, that the Roman yoke would be removed and God was to then take the throne and the Messiah Jesus was then to rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords back then. You can find this out, of course. Desire of Ages, page 103 and page 215. The servant of the Lord expresses there clearly John the Baptist's belief